again, this is Ed Brogdon with Back to Eden. Just wanted to take you a pers on a personal tour of the garden that we designed for the uh, Bulwell Hudson Memorial Garden here at Jones Memorial. And we're going to start right out with the hopscotch runway. Well, why hopscotch runway? What better way of getting kids and people involved in a little physical activity? So we invite you to hop into the garden and hop out of the garden on the exit. So we're going to go and take a personal tour. I really enjoy having kids in our gardens. Uh, as a matter of fact, the garden is uh, to benefit the health and wellness of our children. We have a terrible problem with obesity uh, here in America, particularly in South Carolina. And so the garden is going to focus on giving the physical activity as well as the education and nutrition benefits that comes out of the garden. As we enter the circular, we have a water fountain that is surrounded by beautiful flowers that uh, were donated in part from the community. Again, we're taking the community and inviting them to be a part of the garden. On the outer ring, we have string beans. You see the blossoms. If you look real closely, you can see some of the string beans starting to form. In 10 days or so, we should be picking string beans from the plant. And if you pan up a little bit, we see some bumblebees. On the educational part of it, we want to introduce people to nature. In some cases, what it's doing is investigating. What is that fragrance that you're wearing? People don't know that a lot of fragrance actually come from flowers. So in a garden, the benefit of the bumblebee is to pollinate, not only the plant, but the vegetables as well. The water fountain provides that opportunity for our birds. I can imagine within a mile radius of where we're standing right now, there's probably not a source of fresh water. So this fresh water invites the birds to come in. Once the birds are in our, in our garden sanctuary, there's a very likelihood that they'll see a particular worm, again, part of their food source. The worms there, they're gonna harm the vegetable. But if the bird gets to it first, we don't have to worry about that. This box has chocolate cherry tomatoes. The church has done a great job of harvesting these on time, so what we are looking at now is some green ones. Give them about two weeks or so, and these will be at a color, which could be bright orange, and then deep red, and ready for picking. Particularly one here we're gonna take out. We're taking this out because it's gotten a little disease on it, and we want to remove any stressed fruits from the garden so it doesn't attract other pests. There's another one on the ground. Let's get this one out right here. So we'll discard these. We don't want to invite other boats to come into our garden area. People ask, well, why is there marigolds in the garden? I imagine back in the Garden of Eden, we had a variety of plants as well as, as uh, vegetables. The marigold gives off a fragrance that certain pests that would normally dine on the vegetable don't particularly like. So we put the marigolds around so we don't have to use the pesticide in our garden area. Keep it natural. Look at that. The Japanese cucumber. That is long. That is a beautiful cucumber. This one is about ready for picking. Yeah, we can get that out. And if you get the vegetables out early, what it does is promote other growth. So we always want to keep something growing in the garden. A lot of the fruits that produce a seed, their purpose in life, of course, was to provide that seed for next year's planting. So by picking it early, what you're encouraging the plant to do is produce another blossom. The other blossom, of course, you get to produce another vegetable fruit. Underneath this foliage, we have a big plus sign. On this end, we have watermelons. Let's pull one of the tags here and take a look at it. Sugar baby watermelon. The cartoon character on it really is something that's there to attract the kids to it. This one is just about ready for harvest when the stems starts start to turn a little brown, that gives us a clue that the watermelon is starting to get a little ripe. Now, it is set on a bed of gravel. If we were setting on the ground, you would look for a brown spot on the base of the watermelon, which is another clue that it's about ready for harvesting. Two more, uh, two more watermelons. These are beautiful size, nice and round. The nice color tells us that they're very healthy. And we have a beautiful cantaloupe. Not quite ready for our picking yet. It needs to pick up a little bit more of that crimson color. And we're looking at a whole bed of cantaloupes here. Three are right together and another one on the side over there. This is cucumber. 
Boston pickling. Very, very delicious when they're nice and tender. So I'll leave these here and come back and pick them up after we continue our tour. That black hose that you see running through is part of the irrigation system. One of the key to the health and development of these plants is the fact that they have a constant supply of moisture in the form of a drip irrigation. We use a drip irrigation because it's a really economical way of conserving water, especially in this environment. So the timer is set about every six hours it'll come on and drip for about 10 minutes right to the root zone of the plant. We don't use a spray on this because we try to keep the leaves as dry as possible to discourage any type of fungus that would have a tendency to grow. Nice little baby wobble middle in the center's early stage of development. This watermelon vine patch is spread out over an area about 10 feet. Now I've challenged kids before to grow a watermelon in an area like this where the vines never touch the ground or where the watermelon itself never touched the ground and it can be done. When you interject that type of learning into the process of growing vegetable, the kids get excited about it. And that's what it is all about, creating excitement, a reason for the kids to be outside rather than inside, getting the most out of the environment. Just a lush bed of, uh, of uh, string beans. This is a bush bean variety. Look down, you can see the blossoms. And after these blossoms develop, the next thing that you'll see is a very tiny string bean. The string bean, part of the lagoon family, creates its own nitrogen. This particular soil right now is actually being oxygenated. Oxygen being released right back into the soil. So then fall crops coming in like our broccoli is gonna benefit from the oxygen and the nitrogen that's being put back into the soil over here. This mound here is a, uh, is a it serves two purposes. The main purpose, of course, is to grow vegetable. Before we planted the mound, it was a pretty good depression here. We didn't want water to settle on the back part of the bed. So we create what's called a rain garden. The rain garden is in a press area where water would normally flow into. If you plant in that area, the soil is gonna absorb that moisture so it doesn't puddle, and it's a great area to, to plant in. So we have in the very center of it, we started out with a bale of wheat straw, and then we planted sweet potatoes in it. Yes, we have sweet potatoes growing in a bale of wheat straw. The potatoes will come out, they won't have the dirt on it. Not the dirt's gonna hurt it or not, but it's just another interesting way of growing. And around the bed, we put some petunia flowers, add that additional color. Let's go over to the side because something else we wanna talk about is sweet potatoes growing in containers. This particular bucket here has two sweet potato plants in it that will yield about a bushel and a half to two bushels of sweet potatoes. The containers, were previously uh, used for just taking out the trash. Well, why buy a container if you have a perfectly good, suitable container to use for planting? So we cut it in half. We cut it in half, fill it up with a good compost mixture, we plant our potatoes in, and give them another two months, the vine will start to turn a little yellowish. And that gives us the clue that it's time to harvest. So the kids are gonna dump it out, and from my understanding, the church is gonna use the potatoes to give to the community. Always nice to have some physical activity again in the garden. So we've got a swing set. You can see one of our garden visitors enjoy the swing set. To the, the left of that is a tire. You can't beat a tire hanging in the tree. Good old fashioned fun. And for the church proper, what better place to hold an outdoor meeting? The church has talked about having this Bible study outside. So a great area to come out and just relax. And the garden is a place of relaxation. It's a place where we can grow food. It's a place where we can learn. And it's a place where we can have fun. It truly does connect communities. This particular bush here has some very, very nice looking eggplants. We've got purple ones. We've got some nice eggplants. White ones in here. We've got those good. And our lemon basil. Oh my God, the smell of this is wonderful. Perfect way of preserving these is to put the leaves off put them in ice cubes, freeze it, throw them in the freezer in a big freezer bag. Whenever it's time to cook your dish, take an ice cube out, drop it in the pot, you're good to go. I would imagine this particular basil bush is probably $100, $200 worth of basil. Growing right here in our garden. So beautiful tour of the garden. We started out with just a vacant city lot. We've had numerous of those around the 
Lake of City, Columbia. And this garden just shows you what can be done with a vacant lot. Thanks again for touring the Bulwer Hudson Memorial Garden at Jones Memorial AME Zion Church here in Columbia, South Carolina. It's a beautiful place to come and relax as well as learn. Music